Well, good afternoon, Max. Good afternoon. And anybody else who might be um, enjoying this on a Zoom call, I so appreciate the fact that you were willing to uh, learn a little bit more about a river that is hugely important to me. And the name of the river is the Taunton River. And it is the largest river in southeastern Massachusetts. And it covered um, almost 530 square feet, which is actually larger than the state of Rhode Island. And it's a beautiful river. I have always lived by the river since the time I was a little child. Um, my husband Frank and I reside on and really directly on the river now. My art studio actually is um, borders over the uh, river itself, and it's just it's just beautiful. I'd like to mention that we do have a PowerPoint presentation of slides, and these slides were taken by my husband Frank, and they were taken from our cottage by the river. Um, just a little bit more about the the river begins at a confluence in Bridgewater. Um, it's a confluence of three different rivers. Runs through Bridgewater. Once runs through a very large wetland swamps, so a kind of a sacred area to the Native Americans. Um, it's it was it was a place where they lived and, and where they also held many of their burial rituals. So it's always had a reputation for being sacred and being very, very mysterious, which I think kind of lends a lot to the, the whole concept of the river itself. Um, the Taunton River flows to the south and to the west, and it eventually empties into the Mount Hope Bay. And of course, the, the goal of the river, and it's something that I, I talk about a lot in my book, the goal of the river is, is to reach the ocean which uh, is kind of, I always kind of picture the ocean as being the river's mother, like calling the river back, and the river is always willing to do it. So that, that I know is a, somewhat of a romanticized way of looking at it, but I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, you know, when you love a river, um, and, and I've had so many conversations with the, with the Taunton River, which is why my book, is entitled to conversations with the river. And uh, I did the artwork in the book. And uh, what I would like to do is to read for you some of the selections from my poetry. Now, the, these, these slides that, you, that you're seeing, um, as I say, they, they're, just, they're not in any particular order, although you will see different um, you might recognize different po poems or pieces of poem uh, just from the slides themselves because we tried really hard to match them to the pictures. So the first one, ironically, and of course, when I when I actually chose this as the first poem, I wasn't thinking uh, certainly about the, the possibility of the hurricane um, coming up the coast and, and you know, uh, bringing with it everything that a hurricane does bring. But the first poem I'd like to read for you is called Storm Blessing. And the date of this was Sunday, August 22nd. I am so very, very grateful for my cottage by the river, for my studio cluttered with creativity, ever so close to those rolling waves. For my fearless friend, King Gull, enthroned on seaweed, seaweed, seaweed strewn rock, for my wind chimes dancing despite the storm. I am grateful for my bird feeder families, the morning doves and their children, the cardinal, the chickadees, and yes, even those ill-tempered blue jays. For the groundhog that's tunneled under the deck and the bold cottontail rabbits relishing the bruised crab apples. I gaze at the sometimes star-sprinkled sky 
and the August sturgeon full moon casting a magical path across my water. Most of all, I am grateful for my sense of wonder in the tiniest acorn and the mightiest pine. A blessing sings deep within my soul. I am so very, very grateful. So I like to read off with that because it just will give you kind of a picture of what it's like to live in peace with the river. My next selection is called Walking on Riverside. And I will tell you that Riverside Avenue is a long road in my little town of Somerset. And the entire road, as you can guess, is just curving along with the river. And it's beautiful. You know, in every season of the year, it, it brings forth its just its flora and fauna. Um, it, it's just, a, it is a walk to treasure. So this is what I've made many times. Walking on Riverside. It's a well-traveled, tangled road that runs beside the river. Shared by walkers, runners, and pets. If you look hard enough, you'll see the fiddlehead ferns forcing their faces through ice-caked snow. Hardy harbingers of the still sleeping spring. The swans are circling the sheltering cove, traveling by twos through the marshy grasses. Surrounded by gray geese skidding to a stop along the river's edge. If you are truly blessed and very lucky, you'll spy a seal sunny on the ragged rocks. But that is a special gift, never to be taken for granted. Still, the river and the road remain best friends, winding their way toward home. And I always think of this haunting river as being my backyard because it literally is. So one day when I was sitting out there, just kind of gazing out on the landscape, I, I wrote this poem and I call it my reliable friend. The river always recognizes me, although I have left for long periods of time. I etch the waves on my arm without knowing why I need them. But the river is patient. And when I finally come home, it smooths my jagged edges and subtly shows me the way to follow the curve of the shore. And these, by the way, are the waves that I etched on my arm many years ago. Go on. Not <laughs> it's fine. Go on. This poem is called My Morning Song. As I watch the fire of the rising sun, I am singing my morning song. I am so very glad to be here today, greeting my river as it waves back to me. How wonderful to be given another chance to create something magical. To sing with my faithful bird friends. To splash bright paint on an empty canvas. The morning has such a sweet scent. It is all about beginnings. I will not think of endings. They'll take care of themselves. So I sing, as the sun sparkles in my eyes, I sing a song of thanksgiving for the precious gift of now.
This is called a whisper of change. I heard the river gently whisper that the winter was waiting in the winds with a somber step. After the riotous dance of the one, soft shadows are muting the sun. And there's a misty mirror on the water. There's a crunch in my footsteps as I walk the frost-filled earth. Don't be sad, counseled the river. It's time to turn within, to find the secret spot of warmth, deep in the embers glow. So celebrate the change of the landscape, the rhythm-filled heart of your soul. As the seasons change, the river remains constant. And that's one thing that I, I really truly count on, that I will look out and I will see, I will see the tide coming in and I will see it going out and I will see the river rocks so worn and, and uh, peaceful. So I, I find as, as as I've been writing poetry that a lot of a lot of my poems are very uh, cyclical as far as the turning of the wheel of the seasons is concerned, you know. Now this one is called the journey. In the not quite light, the river shimmers, touching the well worn rocks lining the shoreline. Partners in an infinite dance, they are ever faithful to one another, never doubting the wisdom of an age-old journey as they push against the sea wall and then they gently recede. Final destination is the sea, a mother patiently waiting for her wayward children. But there is no hurry. There is no doubt or fear. There's certainly no regret for that which has been left behind. There is only the grand adventure of now, traveling with the tides. This poem I wrote in December of 2020. And it was on a particular day that the weather was very changeable. Started off really overcast, with like the possibility of a snowstorm. And then the sun seemed to deceive all of that and come up and crystallize the water. The waves of my river rise and then fall again. Waves of sparkling joy and waves of darkest sorrow. Waves of crystalline peace and waves of foaming discord. Waves that gently caress my feet and waves that hurtle over me until I am knocked down. They will not fail to return, although I will. They will continue to kiss through the rocks, which are worn and steadfast. Why do they say a wave breaks? This is so not true. A wave encompasses, it soothes, it spreads, it surrounds the aching shore, bringing it comfort drenching its dryness, leaving it glistening and refreshed. But does a wave break? I hardly think so. Now, one of the slides up here that you may have noticed is one of a, a, a very large seagull. I call him King Gull. And he is really, as far as seagulls are concerned, he is gigantic. But he arrives on the same little 
seaweed covered rock every day. It is as constant as the tides of the river are. So, of course, he has had to preserve a place in his book. <laughs> the river sings with the song of the seagull. They are, after all, sisters, celebrating each day in the joyous company of one another. The river's bubbling laugh soothes the wave tumbled rocks, bathing them in sun sparkle in an infinite dance. The river sings in the gentle breeze of springtime, an ancient hymn of praise and perseverance, a tune that changes as it webs and flows. It is true that sometimes the river does weep for days long gone by, for memories that are tattered and torn. This river has witnessed so much winding with the shoreline, changing with the tide. But its journey is an endless one, searching for the mother sea. It always does what it was always meant to do, nourishing all that it touches. Now, just to keep that same theme, this one is called The King and His Lady. And it is about the King God. The Seagull King returned today, assuming his throne upon the river rocks. But he was not alone. The gray crone perched by his side, looking weathered, weary, sitting stooped in her solitude. She was as close to the king as air, and she touched him with her worn wing, affirming perfection. She is bedraggled and battle-scarred, while the king is strong, ensure of himself. Yet he knows that his crown is Beautiful. He treasures each of her fragmented feathers as they lean together to drink in the day. So many times the king is by himself, but his lady does appear every once in a while and keeps him company. And it is so very true that she is worn and weary. Well, he is very strong, um, but I can tell that he loves her and that the love that they share has gone on for a long time. On the call of Sunday. Early morning sunshine has cast a path upon my river, beckoning me with its babbling bubbles. This day is so very new, pristine in its presence, filled with precious promise. The darkness that blanketed my eyes has finally fled, safely sleeping in the soft clay. Morning, the faint canvas waiting to receive splashes of riotous color. I have been given the gift of another day. I pray that I will use it well. Out of the darkness. The river had a gossamer, gloomy grayness this morning. The snow began to fall, dancing and darting across the dark. It soon settled in. This was no ordinary storm, but a breathing blizzard frosting the beach with marshmallow dollops, 
cloaking the somber skeletal trees in the softest ermine. The seagulls drifted downward, unconcerned about nature's roaring wrath. The river waves frothed and foamed, spewing icy shards of frost. Danger outweighed beauty as the landscape disappeared, creating a new world of peaks and valleys. Finally, darkness descended. The wind began to whisper. A lone star tremulously tried to twinkle, and the waning crescent moon softly sparkled the snow. And this is called a Christmas week message from the river. I heard the whisper of the wind as it white past the river. You cannot fight the tide or the phases of the moon. You cannot stop the seasons, the beginnings, the endings as well. Take a lesson from the seagulls. They simply ride the wind. They never struggle. The storms will always be sudden, fierce, frightening, but they will eventually give way to the holiness of hope. You have but one chance to live, so take it. This year, my plan is to glide with the wind that suddenly rises on the river just as those gulls do. I will ride above the white-capped waves until the sky is clear. I will pick my path among the river racks. Oh, I will be somewhat bruised and very breathless, but I will be far when broken. And here's some more advice from King Seagull. Alone is not the same as lonely. King Seagull taught me that as he balanced on his seaweed strewn throne, standing between the river and the sky. He stands strong, he sighs and sings his prayer of protection. His faith and freedom incantation is meant to be heard by my seeking soul. He shares as he would with any fellow tenant of this earth. A seasoned traveler, he knows that the journey must ultimately be taken alone, although there can be so many guides along the way. And suddenly, He's gone. Another creature that you might have seen, a friend of mine, is Ichabod, who is a crane. And he makes his appearance at the cottage three or four times a week. He's very, his legs are very, very thin. But they're there, really, there he is. They're very strong. He balances on one leg as thin as the waving breeze by the river. He's staring at something I cannot see. He seems so fragile, so far away from home, a silent sentinel at the river's edge. Finally, he spreads his white wings and stretches across the sky, fragility forgotten. And this is some advice from the river itself. This is advice I've heard more than one time, too. But it never, it always, it always rejuvenates me. It always makes me think that 
yeah, I can I can do this. Like I will get to this. Only the river can soften the edges of my storm weary soul. And it always reminds me that I am stronger this season, in spite of the loss of light and the last echoes of laughter. You see, the river only recognizes the newness of things. There's no grief for yesterday and no fear of tomorrow. It is content with the rising and the falling of the tide and the waxing and the waning of the moon. Only the river can reassure me that the dance will always continue, although the partners will most certainly sing. And I'm going to leave you with what I hope will make you feel the peace that I so treasure and enjoy when I sit by the river. It's called the greatest beauty. And yet, there is still great beauty. The sun rises in the changing violet sky. The river water glistens, embracing smooth, time rounded rocks. The birds welcome the daylight, reveling in rain as well as in warmth. And the wildflowers, they open up to drink the dew on their perfect petals. I can hear the wind chimes whisper that the day ahead is ready for me. Yes, it is too true that many unchangeable changes may occur before the twilight tonight. Some will be oh so subtle and slight. Others will be so very permanent. The night will close our weary, worry eyes, and the day will end transforming itself into another precious sunrise. There is no greater gift. So, just to finish off, I would just like to give you just a little bit more practical information about the river. It was first known as the Cutaquat River. And it was named by the Wampanoag Indians. Now, the Wampanoag Indians were true tenants of the earth. They recognized that they were not owners. They were stewards. And they worked very, very hard to preserve their lands and the sea. It was a perfect area because in the fall and the winter time, well, in, in the same, in the fall especially, they harvested their crops. Those they had been, had been building up all coming along. They lived close to the water during the summer. In the spring, they participated in the great run of herring, uh, which they called alewives, because they, they were so abundant in the Tonkin River. And then um, when the weather would really start to get cold, they moved their camps inward and they turned to hunting. They were so very careful to always, always respect the earth. At the time the pilgrims came to America, there were about 50,000 Wampanoag Indians all along the Southeast coast. That eventually dwindled down to about 5,000. They suffered through two, two um, three terrible epidemics, which were actually brought over by European fishermen who were fishing off the coast of Nova Scotia, down around Maine, coming all the way down towards Plymouth. 
and they grew up with them, smallpox. And of course, the natives had no, no immunity whatsoever, and it wiped out entire villages. There was one Indian by the name of Squanto who was taken captive and brought over to England, where he was uh, actually gentrified or Englishified by uh, clergy. And eventually he made his way back to his 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 um, tribe was in Plymouth. There was no child there. He was the only surviving member. And when uh, Mathisoya awarded the pilgrims, gifted them with the land that 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 um the that the pilgrims first built their settlement, the Plymouth plantation, he gifted them land that they believed was sacred because an entire tribe had lived and died there. It wasn't until Massasoit's son, both of Massasoit's, his daughter and his son were educated in um, England as well. And they got English names. When his son came back, his son wanted to be known as Philip. Now Philip was very much aware that there was a huge difference between him, his tribe, and the pilgrims. He saw no evidence of respect for the earth, but he saw like a you know, growth in moving forward and taking more and taking more. And he became convinced that the only way to stop this was to exterminate the pilgrims. And that was the beginning of King Philip's Wars, which lasted for two years. In the King Philip Wars, they had a terrible toll on both the um, pilgrims and the Indians. Actually, the first um, Wampanoag killed in the war was killed in Swansea, Massachusetts, which is not that far from from uh, Osterville and the next town to where I live in Somerset. At any rate, um, the, the history is a sad one. You know, it, it seems to me that the stewards of the earth are constantly pushed back and, you know, attempts are made to stop them, to, to make them quiet, to try to build up everything with, with like more possessions. So now, the Taunton River has undergone a huge metamorphosis. I mean, it went from forming when the glacial deposits were slowly gliding across the, 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 uh, the, the country. It's being a nourishing habitat than to being polluted to have to um, the water actually turned brown because there were so many ironworks in the 1700s that located right on the river, dumped all the iron shavings into the river. And that accounted for its, its, its uh, brown color. Many people thought that that signified pollution, but that wasn't the case. It was the, it was the rust from all of these shavings that were just left at the bottom of the river. <laughs> Much of that has been cleared now and taken care of. And the river, once again, has a pristine look to it. It has, in that case, um, because of that, it has brought back a lot of different um, species of birds, of fish, uh, the small animals you know, all can, you know, can live in, in conjunction with the river, live close by it and, and, and sort of give as well as take from it. There are 114 species of birds that live along the river now. The watershed itself is made up of 562 miles of rivers, lakes, 
bonds, green, and the wetland. There are seven different species of mussels on the river now. 29 species of native fish, 114 species of birds, and 221 lakes and ponds. But it still needs a lot of help. So, the, um, if you are ever interested in learning a lot more about the river itself from a scientific point of view, which is you know more than I could go into, um, the Taunton Watershed Alliance is a wonderful group that has it's a nonprofit organization that has been cleaning up the river. And um, one of the one of the things I love about the Taunton Watershed is that they have a their their housing diamond. They have a caracoon turtle there. And foolishly, someone thought that they could remove him from the river. Caracoon turtles are indigenous to the Taunton River. They thought they could remove him and make him a pet, which of course ruined the, the turtle's ability to live in the wild. And then they tired of him brought him to the animal rescue league of all places. And the Taunton Watershed now has him as their mascot for named fact, I should go to see with Mrs. T. And if you ever get the chance and you're up in that area, go and visit because you won't be sorry. I feel, and you know, if, if you've enjoyed my poetry today and you have an affinity for rivers and for things that change, but don't change. Um, I think you'll really enjoy the alliance as well. So thank you very much. You're a great audience. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. What is the power station picture that I'm going to The power station, that's oh, that's a great question. That's the Montauk power station. It's inactive now. It's been deactivated, but it has also poisoned the land. And, and it was a huge complex. One of the things about the Taunton River is that it is one of two ports in the state of Massachusetts that offers a deep water port. Now, Somerset, in its wisdom at the time, built the Montauk. And then at the other side of Somerset, where the other deep water port is, they built the Brayton Power uh, Plant. Both of them are defunct now, but both have done a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the, the actual, the facade of the, it's kind of like a ghost town, mm -hmm. you know, with the, with the uh, yeah, it makes a great photo opportunity, but um, they can't even dismantle it because of all sorts of federal regulations. Oh, right. I was going to ask if it could be repurposed or something. I don't know. Like a roof or cafe or something. It'll be nice. That 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 was that was the hope, and, and you know, like in, in in the Somerset, we because we're we're a small town and we have a board of selectmen, and they had this great dream that you know we would. Um, sometimes have uh, condos there or a little like a uh, Somerset has a little village but sort of like just an area where you would have run be a waterfront yeah. area yeah. but at this point uh, it, it's all a matter of, of dollars right. you know that they they can't expend on it but I think I think in some ways the fact that it had the the deep ports in the two areas is as much of a curse as a blessing, you know, because because it just enabled all of these these huge tankers to come right up the river to the Montauk, or to come right from Mount Hope Bay um, to the Brayton Point one, it, you know, and they both they both kind of now like monstrosities. Mm -hmm. uh, much of the Brayton Point one has been demolished because they had those huge tanks. But Montauk is just, at one point, Montauk employed nearly every man in Somerset. Mm -hmm. You know, that's that's how, well, Somerset was small mm -hmm. and the power plant was huge. It's surprising that there's not a large town if it's such a big, deep water port. I would imagine that there would be a bigger town built up there. Right. 
when I when I was a child, um, it was a, it was wonderful as far like tax purposes and things like that, um, real estate. It, it, the, 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 these places, both power plants, paid so many taxes that they, that our taxes were very low, and it did bring in an influx of people. Because when I was a kid, there were meadowlands everywhere, <clears throat> and I was as I was a kid. They started to get built up with housing developments, you know, like with cute names like Rustic Acres and Americana Terrace, you know, like that type of stuff. But yeah, it never actually got to the point where it, it really became, you know, a, a, like we don't, we have a, 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 a main street that's, um, got many boarded up buildings and you know it, it's just it never had the chance to get there and now with both plants going uh the taxes are very high and people are are moving out of summer so yeah so i was just going to comment on um, that you know being on the cape so many people write about the ocean and the way you know the beaches it's very nice to hear about a river um it, it just has a contrast because i personally also have an affinity for rivers my father is obsessed with rivers and people yeah we have ancestry like a river people in europe in uh czech what's now czech Republic. but um yeah i, I find rivers extremely soothing and i i do too um, and, and you know i i love the ocean don't get me wrong right. but the ocean I, I don't i don't have the sense of peace like right. even today frank yeah. frank and i yeah. visited the Dowses Beach, yeah, yeah. in uh, I mean, it, it, the waves were just oh, yeah. whipping. Moodya, how about Moodya? The ocean, whereas the river is more calm. Yes, yeah. in, in, in the river, I always feel it, it has a job, it has a mission. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's going to get back to that mother. Right. You know, um, it's the, it's it's like the errant child that branches out, and you know, it has tributaries. But it will all eventually mm -hmm. goes into the you know the one. I know in one of my poems, I remember asking the river if it was ever afraid, mm -hmm. and it just really the the answer was, "Why? I know what I should do. I know what to do, and I do it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just a." Uh, yeah, the river, river to me, and as I say, I, I, I've grown up with it. You know, I've, I've just grown up with the river. You know, and and now I feel like I'm growing old, but the river's not. You know, and I'll think to myself, "You're going to be here someday. I'm not going to be here, but you're going to be here." And I wonder if there'll be somebody else who wants to have those conversations, and I hope so. You know. I hope so. Any other questions? What's your favorite season for watching the river? That's a great question. I would say my favorite season is the fall because there's still a lot of activity on the river, but the fall is when I see the geese start to, we have a lot of geese around in the, in the summertime. And slowly but surely, they start to gather together, and they make this huge clack noise. You know, they're when and I and I know they're ready to go. You know, like they're gonna. They and, and suddenly they're gone, and that's just one example. You know, the falling leaves. Um, when I walk, you know, when I when I go for a walk, I. I, there are there are some places in Dighton and Taunton that uh, have walks that border the river, and when I'm walking in the fall, it just has a whole different connection. You know, it, I mean, it's hot in the summer, obviously. You know, and, and people are using it for all sorts of enjoyment, and you know, the boats are out there, but in the fall. So I would say fall is my favorite, and my second favorite would be winter, because that's when it just it gets silver and quiet, you know. Yeah.
Is that a good place to draw? You can swim in it, or is the current too you, strong? No, you can swim in it. Okay. You can you can definitely swim in it. The current is not strong, except um, there there are rip ties sometimes, mm -hmm. but only when say say like we probably will have some this weekend, you know, because because it's it's so. Um, it's going to be so windy, but uh, yeah, yeah, you can you can swim it. There, there was a time that people believed you couldn't, and they say things like, "I would, I wouldn't go anywhere near that." But you see, that was the mistaken. You could have you could test the water, and it was not polluted. But what it was showing was the heavy iron content. When I was a kid, the house that I lived in was very old. And the river was right across the street, and right down the street was the ironworks. And we used to find these, and they were huge, the head, heads of these nails were huge in the spoke, and they were iron, and they were buried in, in you couldn't walk without, you know, no, you couldn't without, um, you know, protective shoes or flip flops or something. But they were corroding, you know, and I mean, we're talking like millions of dumps of all of this, you know, and um, they actually drowned the river. But that has since disappeared. But, you know, the reputation, unfortunately, is, is slow going, like for people to, to trust it again. I, I have a younger sister who, who um, wouldn't allow her kids to go anywhere near it. And I would, I tell them, you know, like, there's nothing wrong with it. Believe me, many a day, I've taken a chair out to the river and sat in the river, you know, just like, just like sitting there, you know, and and, and just letting the, the the tide lap over me. And it's beautiful. Anything else? Oh, thank you, thank you for being such a good audience.